The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. On today's show, we're going to learn about growing nuts. We'll also visit the Pepperfield Project near Decorah, Iowa, and Chef Stephen Larson's going to give us another great recipe, this time his take on Eggs Benedict. Stay tuned. Garden Connections is coming up next. Well, we're here at Badger Set Farms, and I'm with Philip Rudder, who is running this whole operation. This is his baby, and we're going to talk about nuts. And a lot of times we don't think about Minnesota as being really suitable to nuts, but you've proven it otherwise. Well, you can see them here. And it's taken about uh, 30 years of uh, pretty serious science. This is not an amateur operation here. Um, but they're, these are all species hybrids. We work with three different nut crops. These are the hazels, and they are a bush, not a tree. Okay. And uh, the chestnuts, which are trees, and our new hickory pecan hybrids, which are now ready for us to start oh, talking about just in the last year okay. uh, or so. So it's not and a hickory and it's not a pecan. No. It's all, the, all of these, in fact, this is how we can grow these here. All of these are species hybrids, very complex, actually. Okay. Many generations past the first cross, uh, and including a lot of junk genetics that we have to throw <laughs> you out. kind of weeded through, yep. Right, yep. yeah. Now, you have quite an operation here, and as you mentioned, you've done a lot of scientific research on what, what works. For a home gardener, is it possible for them to grow nuts in their backyard? It absolutely is, with one caveat, which is squirrels. <laughs> okay, so we have some competition. Uh, yeah, here we work on it. We're actually standing next to one of our squirrel devices here. This is a hawk roost, an owl roost that we put up oh. to attract raptors here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tree squirrels have a very hard time getting out here uh, because we've got basically squirrel breaks of grass. Mm -hmm. If you've got 100 feet of grass and a squirrel tries to hop across that, he is lunch. He's lunch. For, okay. for a, a red tail hawk or something like that. Uh, but when you're, if you're in the suburbs and you've got big oak trees around, and if you've already got a lot of squirrels at your bird feeder, it's, um, it can be a battle can to be beat them to the nuts. Yeah. If, you have a, if you have a dog in the yard, they will probably do the job of keeping okay. the squirrels out. All right. Although the dogs eat all of the nuts. They like also. them as well. All right, well, yep. let's take a look at, at, we'll start here with this particular variety. Tell us about how, I mean, this is a pretty good sized bush, as mm -hmm. you said, it's not actually on a tree. How long does it take to get this big and do, what, what are you planting, bare root or? Uh, we will see in the greenhouse how we plant these. We've developed our own uh, system because what we're aiming at is um, uh, both smallholders who have got five or six trees in their backyard or at their small farm and large-scale agriculture. We started picking these with a machine uh, a couple of years ago okay. uh, and uh, we're trying to develop systems that can scale all the way up to soybean level wow. and we think we're actually pretty close. Um, these are these are not ripe yet. This plant actually something you can't see here is that this plant was cut in this whole row was cut entirely to the ground six years ago. Oh, so all this growth in the last all six years. And they that's were great. they were ten years old when we cut them. Okay. And so that's that what just we, rejuvenate them? Yes. Okay. Right. That's the uh, both the American hazel and the beaked hazel come from fire ecologies, oh, okay. and they have to be able to withstand having their top burned off really any time of the year. Okay. And that's what we do instead of pruning. I imagine if you had to prune the corn crop in order to get it to bear, <laughs> right. you know, you can't scale that up. Right. So what we do is we, uh, the foresters call it coppice, mm -hmm. and once every 
about 10 years. We'll take the entire row right down to the ground. Okay. And then you don't have any nuts that year, but right. you may have nuts the year after that. They'll be back up this high okay. uh, one year after In you cut year. them down. Now you have a greenhouse that we're going to discover more things that you're working on in there. But in the meantime, while we're walking down there, we're gonna send you out to the Pepperfield Project and find out about all the great things that's happening there. Stay tuned for more Garden Connections. Well, we're here at the Pepperfield Project, and I'm with David Cavagnaro, and he is going to tell us all about what he's doing here. David, thank you for letting us come out and see your beautiful gardens. My pleasure. Tell us a little bit about the mission of the Pepperfield Project. You, you do so much out here. Well, we're very much interested in teaching people once again how to grow food. It's sort of a lost art in America, <laughs> and uh, I'm being Italian. I was uh, raised in an Italian family where food was just so wonderful. So. I'm really keen on sharing with people the bounty of the garden and helping people to understand how better to, to cook, especially some of the older varieties. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, just to really, really inculcate once again the value of really good of, food. Of good food, yeah. And you've got a lot of it growing here. Yeah. You are doing an event uh, this fall. Do you do it every fall, this, this dinner? This is our first year for, okay. for programming here. So it's, okay. it's a new nonprofit that we form. So okay. we're, we're just getting started. And we, uh, among the many classes and other events, we're also yeah. serving some really fun meals. And this one is from the food you would eat in the 1880s, is that yes, right? Yes, we have a restored log cabin that was built in 1851. And we want to talk about what the pioneers would have found in the Midwest when they came here across the Mississippi in the mid 1800s. Mm -hmm. What were the varieties that were available commercially? There were seed companies already in the mm -hmm. Midwest. What were the very early vegetable varieties mm -hmm. and how are they different from what we might from find today? From what we might eat today, yeah. yeah. And yeah. we've got one here that is something that we still eat today. I love yes. this and your plants look so amazingly healthy. Tell us about what, what kind of squash you've got growing Well, here. these are all different summer squash varieties and in particular the one I want to show you and the one that we're featuring on the menu this fall is one that everyone knows. It's, it's called the summer crookneck squash, crookneck. Yep. early summer crookneck. Yep. Um, what's interesting about the early summer crookneck is that actually this was, this predates commercial varieties. This was a Native American variety okay. that the early pilgrims found when they came to America mm -hmm. in the first place. So really well adapted to our climate. It's very well adapted. It was uh, from the eastern states uh, and upper midwest states mm -hmm. and, and um, it, it entered commerce very, very early on. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and yeah, it's okay, a great one to eat. Yeah, one let's here. take a look at some of those. Um, Well, this is what uh, this is what a crookneck squash looks like when you eat it, young right. and tender. Yeah. This is what they become when they get a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger. When this they get will, lost under these big, beautiful well, leaves. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> these I'm actually saving seed off of some of these, so I oh, let sure. them get big and mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and ripen for seed. Mm -hmm. But this is and the they're really attractive you, as gourds too. Well, they are. Wonderful. You can actually dry, you can you can leave mm -hmm. these on the on the vine until fall and pick them and dry them for decoration. They're beautiful in the uh -huh. fall. They turn mm -hmm. kind of uh, more orange in color. Uh -huh. But so this, this is, is the lovely, eating size. It's mm -hmm. the eating size, and what's lovely about the crookneck, it's very creamy. I like them better than zucchini. They're mm -hmm. they're very smooth and creamy, and um, it's just my, one of my favorites. Still, so one how of are you going to prepare squash. these for your dinner? Um, have you decided uh, we're yet? Not, no, we haven't decided yet. <laughs> okay. we're, we're going to um, we're going to work that out at the work last minute, yet. depending right. on what all is available. Right. We're growing the entire menu in the garden this year. And, Wonderful. Um, once we get everything, the way we cook around here is that once everything is laid out then the condition and variety of vegetables we have on hand dictates what we're going to do. Dictates the menu. And we probably won't Eating decide fresh. until the very last minute. Right. Well, these look fantastic. I understand you have some beans that you're going to show us. We do. Let's, Let's go take a look. All right. Sounds good. good. Well, we're here in the beans, and you're going to show us a variety. I love the name of this. Black, Black Valentine. Black Valentine. Yes. <laughs> Sounds so dark and romantic. Well, you know, one of the um, things I remember from my grandmother, she always called green beans string beans. Sure. Well, because in the early days, uh, what we call snap beans or green beans, they all had strings on the, on on the, the ends, one side the of the bean yeah. that you had to uh, pull off. 
Um, and I can remember my grandmother doing that on early varieties. Well, now, of course, there's no such thing as a string bean. All modern beans have no strings. Right. And for this dinner, we're growing um, two varieties that are very early. This is one of them. And then also a variety that Burpees introduced in the um, latter part of the 1800s called stringless green pod. Okay. And these were the first stringless snap beans. Okay. So this one is Black Valentine. And it's, it's a, it's Look a, at that, it's beautiful. It's a very nice bean that, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, um, it's actually, you know, when you pick it, there's no string. They're mm -hmm. very tender. Mm -hmm. You can also leave them on the plant and let them go dry, and then you mm -hmm. have black beans for black bean soup. Oh, great. But, can I uh, taste one? Yeah. Yeah, they're, st they're a little tougher than, than modern green beans. And this one's a little bit, uh, you know, you'd pick, them, you'd pick them younger like this, like mm -hmm. this one, really nice and young and tender. Yeah. And what we did with these, what we're doing um, for the dinner is pickling them. So oh. I've just pickled a big batch of these and we're okay. going to serve them as pickled Great. beans. Now, when so. you start working with varieties that have been around for so long and, you know, we think of kind of modern gardens and what we have to do to make our plants healthy. Are there any special steps that you take to grow these heirloom varieties? No, not really. And, and the, the wonderful thing about growing the older varieties, especially if you have a diverse garden like we have here with many different varieties, um, they, they're, they're tried and true after all. These varieties sure. have been around for a long time and they're still being grown because they're successful. Mm -hmm. They tend to be um, uh, hardy and relatively disease resistant. Naturally, a lot of modern varieties, they've bred in specific disease resistances. Mm -hmm. So old varieties don't always add up in that regard. But the, the old timers that have stood the test of time, you know, they, they're tough. They're, and, they're um, tough. That's one reason why I really grow so many of the heirloom tomatoes and nice. squash and beans and corn and so forth. Sounds great. And you mentioned corn. That's where we're headed next. Yes, I've got an interesting story on corn. Great. Can't wait to hear it. Well, David, I'm amazed by your corn. Some of this is just enormous. Well, you know, a lot of the old varieties were much taller than the, uh, than the corn that we have today. And uh, for instance, Hickory King and old field corn uh, before hybrids came in, mm -hmm. uh, look how tall these are. Um, the one I want to show you, though, that we're going to feature in our uh, 1800s in dinner, dinner yep. is a sweet corn. Okay. And um, this is called Stoll's Evergreen. It was uh, one of the very early commercial sweet, sweet corns that was available okay. in the 1800s. And let me show you what's different about it from okay. the corn yeah. today. So I'm going to pick an ear here and, um, and show you what this looks like uh, on the inside. Oh, and the first beautiful. thing you'll notice is that it's white. It is. It's, you don't see that very often anymore, do no, you? No, because, and, and most people don't, we take yellow corn for granted. People mm -hmm. don't realize that in the 1800s there was no such thing as yellow sweet corn. Oh, okay, all so it was early, all white. All the early sweet corns were white. And... Um, Sweet corn is, is actually not an ancient crop. It came into the American Indian um, diet uh, very late in, in their tenure in, in North America. And then uh, we took it up and bred yellow corn from the whites. But uh, this yeah, is still one of the old heirlooms. It's available still in uh -huh. some of the seed catalogs. Seed Savers carries it. And, and it grows well and it looks well, beautiful. It, it, uh, you can see how, how healthy it is. And, and it's relatively, of course, it's, it's sweet, but it's not as sweet as the super sweets that right. people buy now. Right. But there's so much more nutrition in these old sweet, oh, in these old okay. sweet So corns. good for you and tasty. Very delicious. good for you, and, it, and it's snow white and beautiful. <laughs> and it is beautiful as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for You're letting us come welcome. out. You're doing wonderful work here, and good luck with that dinner. It sounds like We're it's going to really be fantastic. We're really excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Stay tuned for more Garden Connections. We are back at the Badger Set Farm and now we are in the greenhouse. So we're with second generation. This is Brandon and he is working on propagation of these trees. Is that right? Is that what we're yeah, doing here? Yeah, I, I work on more or less everything, but everything. Uh, I'm, I'm in the, we're in the greenhouse here, which is where we're trying to get stuff out to the farmers as uh, cheaply and as reliably as we can. As possible. Both, both at the same time. Sure, yeah. sure. Okay, well these are the hazelnuts right. that we saw up on the hill. Yep. Okay. And you've got some tubes here. Is this how they start? Yeah. So this is uh, this system is what we call tubelings. 
Uh, and each of these tubes is uh, separate, which allows for us to rearrange stuff as they grow. Uh, and mm -hmm. these are nearly uh, to the point where they're going to go to the next stage up in our outer greenhouse there. Okay. Uh, when and how about, old are these? Ready to go. These are probably two to three months old, okay. but let me check here. We've got uh, ev tag. every one of these has got a tag on. Yeah, this is a research one. Yeah, so this is actually so this was been started done pretty well. Yes, on the 29th started of June. On, started on 629. Yeah. Wow. So it's and actually very... we're doing better than the last couple of years. Yeah, no, that's yeah. great. That's great. So then this is the next step, and then they go to a different location to further grow. Right. How yeah. old are they before you send them out to people to plant in their own, whether it's a farm or a backyard or... How right. old should they be? Yeah, that'll be anywhere between a month and a half to three months, generally. Okay. Uh, that way they are still, they end up being about this size, okay. uh, a little mm -hmm. bit shorter. We'll come through and uh, decapitate them, we call it. Uh, so we'll come through and once they have reached uh, the stage where they hide that green tag for the short mm -hmm. tubes here, mm -hmm. which some of these are at, uh, we'll come through and we'll we'll hit it all with a, a, a hedge trimmer. And what's the purpose for, for cutting them off? Yeah, right. It's a lot of people are like, ah, you're killing your <laughs> poor little baby trees. Yeah, yeah. and so what it does is uh, a couple of things. One is it sends a browse stimulus. So all of these little trees are screaming to each other, I've just been eaten. And so what that does <laughs> is apparently it really uh, releases some anti-browse chemicals much uh, more strongly than than, than if they had it. Right. All right. And plus, That's because they're all talking to each other uh, that way, they they really do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And the okay. other is so kind of an inoculant almost, or a yeah, vaccine for browse. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and then the the stem toughens up also. Okay. Uh, you can see if as these grow taller and taller in here with very little wind, mm -hmm. they can get. Uh, they can Maybe get a little, a little, little bit weak, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that way that toughens up the stem, makes them ready for the world out there. Uh, and up. then um, it also uh, stimulates new growth and We'll maybe show you some of that later, but when the new buds come out, there's a stage of about a week, week and a half, where those new buds will adapt to whatever conditions you put them in oh, okay. without having to go through the shade house and right. that sort of thing. Right. Okay. Uh, so that helps quite a bit. Makes them a little bit hardier sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I suppose these are just like any other transplant. There's always that shock. And right, and, and, that's, and that's, that's one of the things. So if, you, if the bud is in the right stage of growing, it's far enough that it's gonna, it's like, oh, I really better keep on growing. Uh -huh. And uh, young enough that it can still adapt. Adapt, uh, all right. And that's also, uh, th with the tubelings here, it's, it's a different system from bare root dormant. Uh, so we just planted three acres here about a mm -hmm. week and a half ago. Okay. Uh, and so you can do it. It's not quite as sensitive for timing. In, you, know, you don't have to do it first thing in the spring. Right, just in the spring. Um, and with the tubeling there, uh, this tube, it comes out in a single piece wow. look at that. like that, uh, and that doesn't look too bad. No, uh, good actually, you got down. pretty good, pretty good roots going there. Yep. And if you can get that into the ground without smashing it, you won't get uh, much for transplant shock, at least nice. as far as the roots are concerned. Right. So we get we do that without smashing the root ball, and just fill it mm -hmm. in and, and water around it. Right. Uh, they can really just keep on going. Nice. Nice. So we looked quite a bit at the hazelnuts on the top mm -hmm. of the hill, but you have other nut trees that right. your dad mentioned that you guys have. Right. And so these are grown the same way. What are we looking at here? Which yeah. ones are these? These are chestnuts. Uh, and I love that. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, there's the nut there and then with the two straps. So this nut is still attached there mm -hmm. and feeding. At this point, um, actually, if the nut came off, uh, it would still be okay. And okay. that's, that's another thing. I, Sometimes, that's why we have a greenhouse in the first place, uh, the nuts are really, really good food. <laughs> uh, and, and wildlife would rather have that. Right, yeah. yeah. And so we, we were doing, we were doing um, nursery out in our, our garden for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But by the time we finally gave up, we had a Rime cloche and uh, an electrified deer fence with peanut butter on it. Uh, and an all kinds of deterrents and, 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 an elect and another electric fence for the the uh, smaller things like woodchucks and mm -hmm. uh, 
also raccoons. Wow. Uh, so you moved the then, buffet inside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and look at you've got a root growing out the end already. Yep. So it yep. looks great. Okay, and, and you've got going. one other variety here. Yep, and these are the hickory pecans here, and these are the newest ones that we have going here. They take a long time to get producing, uh, so mm -hmm. our a little bit different shaped leaf there. there. Yep. Yep, and these actually, this is a compound leaf there, uh, and uh, the young ones just have three leaflets, and mm -hmm. older ones will have more. Great. Uh, and these really do go out the bottom like crazy. So like crazy. We're, we're, so we're good and healthy. In the, in the early stages of figuring out how this system works. On All this, right, they sounds take a good. Time to get going. Well, it looks like you're doing good work here, Brandon. We are going to now visit with Chef Stephen Larson. He's going to give us his take on Eggs Benedict. And when we come back, we're going to actually look at some nuts. Stay with us for more Garden Connection. Hi, I'm Chef Stephen Larson. Welcome to my kitchen at Quarter Quarter Restaurant in Harmony, Minnesota. Today's recipe is going to be for leeks eggs benedict. So we're going to use leeks, which are uh, in the onion family, and they look kind of like a large green onion. Uh, very mild, very delicious. And you can certainly use that tender part of the root too if you've cleaned off the, uh, the major root ends. There's nothing wrong with that. It's quite delicious. And we need a total of approximately three cups of leeks here. To that, we're going to start off with three tablespoons of unsalted butter. And we're going to put that into a small saucepan. So once the butter is melted, we can add the leeks. And we'll just scoop those right in. And we're going to let those cook over a low heat uh, covered for about four minutes. We call that sweating or cooking very slowly. All right, so now we take a look at these, see how they're doing. All right, that looks very good. So now we need to add some liquid to that. So I'm going to use a quarter cup of chicken stock and a quarter cup of heavy cream. And we want to let that boil for just a minute or so in order for the leeks to get nicely softened. And into the food processor we go. We're going to put it back into the pan in order to keep it warm. All right, so now we're going to let this sit, stay warm. While we cook our eggs, we will need three quarters of a cup of heavy cream, which is also going to become the basis for the sauce, and three quarters of a cup of shredded aged white cheddar. We will, of course, need some eggs for our eggs. So we have some beautiful duck eggs here from the farm, and we'll let those eggs cook to the desired doneness. You want to be generous with that leek puree. It's actually quite mild. It doesn't have nearly the onion bite as you might think. All right, so let's see how these are doing. That looks fantastic. Okay. So now we need to bring these over. Gently lift out of the pan. And we'll top each with the sauce. 
And just to finish things up and make it look pretty, a little sprinkling of Spanish smoked paprika. And there's the finished dish, leeks and eggs benedict, because there's nothing better than eating fresh from your garden. Well, Brandon did a great job showing us in the greenhouse how you get things started and how quickly they grow. It's really amazing. But now yep. let's take a look at some finished nuts. Absolutely. <clears throat> they are, they're, they're highly variable because genetic diversity is what we have to have in order to get them to grow and adapt here. Uh, so each nut is, is probably from a different bush. Uh, within uh, the bush, the nut shape is identical. So every different shape you see is a different bush. It's a different bush. Oh, okay. And a slightly different flavor, which is basically good. It's the real reason we can grow them here is we have this diversity to work with, but mm -hmm. we're at the point where it's a little too much diversity <laughs> and we need to get the product a little more uniform. A little, a little more refined. Well, Brandon has taken some of these and cracked them for us. So, give this back to you. And yep. this is what they look like. There we go, yeah. Now, once the shell has opened up. Yeah. And so this is. That's the kernel. This is what I'm gonna make a hazelnut crust out of my cheesecake. Yep. yep. All right, we'll give you one too. I'm sure you never tire of tasting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't. Yep. Oh, That's great. That's wonderful. So, hey. Thank you so much for You're letting us come well. out and learn. Brandon, thank you so much. Thank you. you Great come. job and wonderful to learn more about how people can grow nuts in Minnesota. Well, thank you for joining us here on Garden Connections. I hope to see you again next time. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham.